speaking English. Um, <laughs> from a small island on the edge of Europe. Um, now, I have two jobs in this meeting. First of all, to tell you what the left say about Brexit, and secondly, what's going to happen next. Now, the problem is what the left say about Brexit is confused and all over the place, and I've got no idea what's going to happen next, and nor does anyone else. So this is going to be a difficult meeting in many ways to present. What I can say with certainty is that we are now in the depths of a very, very deep political crisis in Britain. There is no question uh, the crisis is extraordinarily deep. The referendum we had in 2016 to exit the European Union already destroyed um, the David, uh, David Cameron as Prime Minister. It's now uh, well on its way to destroying Theresa May, our current Prime Minister, who is effectively finished uh, politically. Uh, after two years of negotiation, Theresa May managed to do something that people thought was impossible. She managed to unite the entire political establishment against the deal with the EU. It's extraordinary. Um, she has managed to achieve the biggest uh, defeat for a government in the House of Parliament uh, ever recorded by a British government in um, the period of British uh, democracy. Uh, she then followed that, that up by achieving the, the fourth biggest defeat in the history of any government in Britain for the deal which she put a second time to, uh, to, to Parliament. She then said last week that if Parliament agreed to her deal, she would resign as Prime Minister. And they still rejected it. Not because they wanted her as Prime Minister, by the way. It's a very bad, it's a very bad deal. Uh, and then the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, asked one of the Cabinet Ministers, is she going to put the deal to Parliament a fourth time? To which the Cabinet Minister replied, fuck knows. <laughs> I am past caring, it's like the living dead here. <laughs> Which is not the language you normally hear on the BBC. Um, now, this, this, as I say, it's an extraordinary political, extraordinary political crisis. In response to this, the, par the British Parliament, the parliamentarians, the members of Parliament, decided that they were going to take control of the process. Uh, that they were going to make decisions. And apparently... Uh, it's about 110 years since something similar has happened in the House of Parliament, which actually rather begs the question what members of Parliament do all day. They're not making decisions about how the country is run, but they decided that they were going to take the initiative. And uh, earlier this week, they discussed eight different alternatives uh, to Theresa May's deal, all eight of which they rejected. In other words, no really, nobody really knows what the outcome of this is going to be. We were supposed to leave the European Union yesterday. We now have another, I think, 11 days to decide what we're going to do before the next deadline falls. And it's still completely unclear what the outcome will be. Um, the motion in Parliament that came closest to passing was for a, a, a customs union with the, Euro with, with, with the European Union. The one that came second was for a second referendum or some kind of uh, broader ballot uh, on, 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 what on what should happen yet. But it's not clear that any of these alternatives can win the support of, of Parliament. And therefore, the political and it's entirely possible that Britain will leave without any kind of deal with the European Union. Uh, so the political instability that we're witnessing is likely is likely to um, to continue. Uh, and at some point, Theresa May will, will, will go. The Financial Times, the main sort of uh, pro-capitalist newspaper in, in Britain, ran a story this morning saying that Theresa May has a choice. Either Parliament is going to destroy her party, the Conservative Party, or she'll put the vote to the British people. She'll, she'll have a general election and the people of Britain will destroy the Conservative Party. Either outcome would be fine by me. But nonetheless, this is, as I say, an extraordinary situation to be in. Now, to the mass of ordinary people witnessing this, British politics, mainstream politics, seems completely dysfunctional today. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't translate into protest for a progressive outcome automatically. Uh, a lot of what we've seen in Britain in recent months has been a degree of passivity. 
paralysis, people watching what's <coughs> happening, or people just bored of, of the endless debate about Brexit and so on, it doesn't automatically translate into people doing something um, to challenge what's happening. And that problem is actually reinforced by the way in which the Labour Party, the main party of the centre-left, led by Jeremy Corbyn, has also been drawn into this um, bubble of parliamentary debate and discussion. And again, it demobilises uh, people. And in that context, by far the largest protest that's happened in recent months was a protest of several hundred thousand people demanding a second uh, referendum, essentially a rerun of the referendum on Britain, British membership of the European Union, which I think will be a disaster for reasons I'll come back to uh, later on. But I think it's quite important to say that a lot of left-wing people accept that position that there should be a second referendum. And therefore you have this contradictory situation where there are thousands of, of young, radical people marching on, on the street to demand an outcome which will, be, which will probably have right-wing repercussions, led by a group of people from the heart of the British political establishment, the people who used to surround Tony Blair and Gordon, Gordon Brown, um, members of the Liberal Democrats, one of the Liberal parties in Britain, and section, sections of the Conservative Party who've taken a pro-European stance. So it's a very weird and contradictory situation. The final point about, uh, about the environment in which these, these debates are taking place is that there is also the profound danger of radicalisation to the right. If you look at the people who are trying to benefit from this political crisis, it's not just the, the radical left, it's also the radical right. Uh, yesterday in Parliament, there were, by my reckoning, five different right-wing demonstrations converging on Parliament. There are tens of thousands of people protesting in Parliament for a right-wing agenda, accusing uh, Parliament of, of a betrayal of Brexit, but seeking to use this to exploit it, to, to, to pull it in the direction of anti-migrant, and in particular an Islamophobic direction, an anti-refugee direction, and so on. Um, the force, there are many different forces involved in this, but one of the key ones is UKIP, the UK Independence Party, which used to be a big Eurosceptic party, which effectively collapsed after the referendum, because the referendum has essentially done its job, <laughs> taken Britain out of the, Euro the, the European Union. It's now trying to rebuild, but the way it's rebuilding is opening up to outright fascists, figures like Tommy Robinson, one of the leading um, participants in the, in the fascist street mobilisations, uh, and so on, and attempting to radicalise in a right-wing Islamophobic direction. So it's a dangerous time in British politics. So that's the background. The second point I want to make is why, why this crisis in Britain? Now, often you hear a simplistic argument that what's going on is, is a split inside the capitalist class. That's far too simple uh, in, in, a, in a way. It's true that in the period after the Second World War, sections of the capitalist class in Britain believed that Britain could uh, have a future as a sort of former colonial power, as an ally of America and so on, independent of Europe. That argument within the core sections of, of capitalism in Britain was settled several decades ago. Overwhelmingly, the large corporations, the large banks, the large institutions of British capitalism support British membership of the European Union. It's the overwhelming pro-capitalist pro uh, position. There are exceptions, of course. Small businesses, it's different. Some <laughs> financial firms, although a third of the uh, trade of the, of the City of London is directly with Europe. So uh, even for, from the perspective of the financial centres in London, Europe is, is critical. So for the, for, for the bulk of capitalists, they want to be part of Europe. For the political establishment, it's different. Historically, if you go back to the 1970s, the last time Britain had a referendum on Europe, uh, it was the Labour Party, the left, centre-left party, that was mostly deeply divided over the question of Europe. Um, back then, the left of the Labour Party, which is where Jeremy Corbyn originates from, uh, essentially had a uh, 
left-wing rejection of the European Union and saw the forerunners to the European Union as essentially a boss's club, as a, as a pro-capitalist institution that should be rejected. And this was a huge debate within the Labour Party. The Conservative Party back then was largely, by, by the mid to, to late 1970s, largely pro-EU, supported um, the formation of the single market and so on and so forth. That situation changed in the 1980s and 1990s, and it changed in two very important ways. First of all, as a result of a whole series of crises that the British economy faced and political battles that took place in British society, the Conservative Party, the main party of British capitalism, began to internalise a sort of nationalist rejection of the European Union, which has become the, the sort of dominant politics of most of the base of the Conservative Party, of a large uh, section of the Tory, uh, of Tory uh, M MPs, and quite large numbers of Conservative voters. Uh, Euroscepticism became a quite dominant phenomena on the centre-right of politics from the 1990s uh, onwards. That was reinforced by the emergence of UKIP as a, as a harder right uh, Eurosceptic party, which pulled um, the Tories further in that direction. In other words, what you're seeing today is a breakdown of the relationship between the interests of capital, large capitalist firms, and the Conservative Party, which historically has been the main representative of those firms. It's part of a broader process of the hollowing out of centre ground politics. The same kind of phenomena which leads to the crisis around the Macron government in France with the Gilets jaunes and so on and so forth, the same processes that lead to the polarisation of, of American politics between Donald Trump on the one hand and forces like the DSA, uh, Bernie Sanders on the other hand, this same global phenomena of the hollowing out of the centre ground is reflected in the crisis over Brexit. So one of the shifts that's taken place over the last 20, 30 years is the pull of, of Euroscepticism in the Tory party. The second shift that's taken place is around the Labour Party where faced with the, um, the imposition of neoliberalism by Margaret Thatcher, sections of the Labour Party increasingly came to, came to see the European Union not as a pro-capitalist bosses club, but as some kind of potential shield against uh, Thatcherism, a shield against neoliberalism. And from the, 19, the late 1980s onwards, increasingly the Labour Party in Britain became a, a broadly pro-EU uh, party, as did most of the major trade unions in Britain. Not only that, but if you look among younger people, really anyone, anyone under the age of about 40 in Britain, support for the European Union became the sort of instinctive uh, feeling among young people. In other words, it, it reflected a sort of almost a naive internationalism. Faced with the alternative of the hard right of the Conservative Party, which was strongly Eurosceptic, most young people who, who saw themselves as being on the left gravitated to some kind of soft support for the European Union and associated institutions. So that's the sort of backdrop to the crisis that's taking place. Now, when the referendum came in 2016, what you found was that both the working class and the left were bitterly, bitterly divided over this question. If you look at the vote in the referendum, the vote was almost split evenly down the middle. But what you find is lots of extremely disenfranchised working class people, for example, in, in the kind of northern working class cities where, 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 where I grew up, who voted... Uh, to leave the European Union for a combination of reasons, some of which are to do with nationalism, xenophobia and so on. But bundled up with that was a very, very powerful anti-establishment sentiment. You have to remember, all four of the biggest political parties represented in Parliament called for people to vote for Remain in the referendum. Voting to leave was seen as, as a way of kicking back at the establishment and everything that's gone wrong in British society over 20 or 30 years. <coughs> at the same time, it, it, it was precisely the kind of people who've joined the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, 
young radicalising uh, people who overwhelmingly voted for Remain. So you have this paradoxical uh, situation in which Jeremy Corbyn himself is quite sceptical of the European Union, but much of his base of support inside the Labour Party are pro-European uh, to some degree uh, or other. And we should remember the Labour Party of today is not the same as the Labour Party was five or ten years ago. The Labour Party today is a party of half a million people, hundreds of thousands of whom have joined in the recent, in the recent past, and it is incomparably younger and more radical than it has been historically for the last 40 or 50 years. So the working class w was divided, the radical left was also divided. As I say, most of the, 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 the sort of soft left around the Labour Party took a Remain position. If you look at the harder revolutionary left, most of the organisations eventually took a, a position uh, to leave the, European, leave, the European, leave the European Union, but they were relatively isolated. If you look, for example, at most trade unions, one or two small trade unions took a Leave position, the bulk of the trade unions took a Remain position. So these were arguments that split the working class, but also split the left. Now, coming out of this, there are a whole range of different left-wing positions which have emerged. And what I want to try and do for the rest of the meeting is I want to outline the, the different positions that, that, that have been arrived at, both on the Remain side and the Leave side, by different left forces in British society, and explain some of the arguments and what my position is in those arguments. First of all, I want to talk about the pro-EU left in Britain. And there are different versions of this argument. The first and most simple version is an argument that says that the European Union essentially is a beneficial, benevolent, positive feature of British society. Um, that is essentially the position taken by the main, by the only sort of uh, major trade union confederation in Britain, the TUC, uh, took that position, for example. In other words, the, the, the Trade Union Congress, the TUC, takes a position that the European Union gives us workers' rights, environmental protections, etc., <coughs> etc., therefore we should support the European Union. This is a response that really goes, ac goes against the entire reality of what everything that the European Union has done over the last 20, 30 years, everything it represents in European society, the minute you start to unpick uh, that question. Uh, I won't go through the arguments because there's been a lot of discussion about this already at this event, but one only has to look at the situation in Greece, where the role of the, of the European institutions, the European Central Bank and European Commission, were to work alongside the International Monetary Fund to police austerity uh, to such a dramatic extent that something like 20% of the Greek population, according to the figures I've seen, now live in extreme material deprivation. This is barbaric, what's happened, but it's not isolated to Greece. You look at the practice of the European Union in, in the Spanish state, in Ireland, in Italy, and so on, and it's profoundly anti-democratic, and profoundly pro-austerity, pro-neoliberal, and so on. In other words, what the European Union has come to do is to function as a sort of last line of defence of, uh, of European capitalism when it's challenged. If you look at the Gilets jaunes movement in France, the, the Yellow Jackets at the moment, although it's a complex, contradictory movement, it's broadly a radical left movement, or it's broadly a left movement, broadly a progressive movement. But one of the um, arguments that comes up again and again from the protesters in France is that the European Union is part of the problem because of the straitjacket of public se sector spending cuts it imposes and so on. This is a, a common argument which I'm sure people have encountered. Of course, I can add to that that the, the role of the European Union in accompanying NATO and its push into Eastern Europe and so on and so forth, its role in policing the, the, the global imperialist system and so on and so forth. Now, faced with that argument, there is a second and slightly more sophisticated version of this, which is the argument essentially put by uh, Yanis Varoufakis and the DM25 people. People will have encountered them, I think. And their argument is not 
that the European Union is a straightforwardly progressive body. They acknowledge that the European Union is impl implicated in pushing neoliberalism and so on and so forth. But the argument that they make is that the EU is reformable and that the way that the argument is made in Britain is that the terrain on which we have to reform, the Europe, reform Europe is from within the European Union. In other words, we have to stay part of the European Union in order to press for reforms. The problem with this argument is that it completely neglects to understand the way that the European Union is structured and what it represents. The European Union, you see, if, if the European Union was a single capitalist state, um, which represented a concentration of capitalist power across Europe, and there was a single European ruling class and a single European working class, this position would have a certain amount of logic to it. You know, in Germany, in Britain, in France, what we do as socialists is we put pressure on our state for reforms. That's often a lot of what we do as, as, as we're out campaigning, struggling and so on. This is not the nature of the European Union. The European Union is neither a single pan-European state institution, nor is it simply a collection of different nation states. It's a more complicated body. But what the European Union represents is a way of rescuing the national capitalisms of Europe that simultaneously creates European institutions like the European Central Bank, like the European Commission, which are profoundly anti-democratic, which are not elected institutions, which are not reformable in that, co in, 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 that, in that common sense. Moreover, if you want to fundamentally change these structures, which is what any process of reform would involve, you have to win the support of every member state of the European Union. In other words, to have a, a, a significant... A, a, significant capacity to transform the European Union would mean simultaneously establishing a radical left government across the 27 uh, states of Europe. And the moment we talk in those terms, it becomes ludicrous. Because if we did that, we wouldn't be messing around with the European Union, we'd be establishing our own forms of working class internationalism. The European Union is not the forum or the terrain to have uh, this, 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 this argument. Faced with these arguments, there is a third group of people who voted Remain in the referendum that I want to talk about, which is people who accept pretty much everything I've said so far, but still voted Remain. In other words, they don't believe, they believe that the European Union is a pro-capitalist, neoliberal institution, they believe that the European Union is fundamentally unreformable, but they still support membership of the European Union. And the argument for this is very simple. Now is not the time, because if you vote leave, what you will do is you will align yourself with people on the right of politics. People like Nigel Farage, the leader of the UK Independence Party, the right wing of the Conservative Party, and so on. And it will be a mistake uh, to do that, goes the argument. Now, these people have a, have a serious argument because they're driven to a large extent by fears of the radical right and fears of racism. They want to show their solidarity with EU migrants. And, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment because I think that's a serious argument. However, I think the argument is wrong uh, for, 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 I think, three different reasons. First of all, I think it's wrong to see the European Union as any kind of systematic barrier to racism. Um, because of the way that the European Union seeks to buttress neoliberal capitalism, the European Union also acts as an incubator for racism. If you look across Europe, there is almost no country in Europe which does not have a large and growing radical right racist force in society at the moment. It's also the case in, in many of these countries, the radical right, certainly when it gets close to or achieves some degree of power, is perfectly happy to coexist with the institutions of Europe. If you look at Poland, if you look at Hungary, if you look at Italy, yes, these, the, 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 the radical right parties use rhetorical 
uh, Euroscepticism, but in practice they're quite happy to function as part of this, the, 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 the European Union. Moreover, if you look at the nature of the European Union, and I'm sure this has already been discussed uh, th th this weekend, the idea that the European Union, by supporting freedom of movement internally, is anti-racist is highly questionable, because the concept of freedom of movement only extends as far as the borders of Europe. In other words, it rests on a distinction between European citizens and non-Europeans. And the, the very processes that allow freedom of movement are also the processes of the construction of, of a fortress Europe which systematically excludes refugees. And this compromises any genuine anti-racism uh, in the way that Europe is constituted. The third argument against this position is, I think, it's overly pessimistic one example of this came very soon in the aftermath of Brexit in Britain, because there was a deep pessimism that unfolded in 2016 after uh, the Brexit vote, in which people said there would be a steady move of politics to the right, um, the Conservative right would triumph, uh, the UK Independence Party would be dominant alongside the right wing of the Conservative Party, and so on. The problem with that argument is, with, is in, with, within months uh, of the Brexit referendum taking place, there was a general election called in Britain in which Jeremy Corbyn, this extremely radical figure leading the Labour Party, came very, very close to winning the election uh, and forming uh, a new left-wing government in Britain. In other words, it's not automatically the case that out of this political crisis, there'll be a right-wing yeah, uh, right response. And anyway, uh, if we say that we can't make these arguments about the European Union, by default, we surrender this terrain to the radical right who will then shape the argument. And this is a profound mistake. Now, those are the various kind of remain positions that have been taken on the left, which I think are all mistaken positions. I want to finish by saying a little bit about the different leave positions that have been taken. Again, I think there are different kinds of positions you could take uh, here. The, the, the first position is the position taken by what I call the nationalistic left. Uh, and by that I mean people like the Communist Party of Great Britain, some sections of the Labour Party. Uh, you people are, are, are familiar with these arguments. It's the same argument that's coming from uh, Sarah Wagenknecht a little while ago in Germany. It's the same argument that comes from Mélenchon in France, <coughs> which is essentially an argument that Globalisation has hurt working class people, and therefore a response to globalisation has to be a fundamentally nationalistic uh, response. So elements of progressive demands for working class people, but also elements of anti-migrant racism begin to creep into the position. Um, this, I think, is a, is a deeply mistaken argument and one that we have to, we have to resist. What the argument, in, certainly in Britain, tends to accept is the idea that migration to Britain drives down wages. Absolutely commonplace argument now in the British, uh, this section of the British left. We have to respond to this in the hardest possible terms and say, quite simply, it's not immigration that drives down wages, it's racist divisions within the working class that drive down wages. And by accepting the arguments for immigration controls, we simply reinforce and tolerate that poison of racism inside the working class. Uh, so this is a position I think we have to, we have to reject. I can say more about it, people want, but I think people are familiar with the argument. The second leave position is the position that essentially Jeremy Corbyn, as leader of the Labour Party, accepted after the referendum, which is quite a good argument. What Jeremy Corbyn really said to people was, we have to accept the, the reality of, of, of Brexit, people have voted, we're going to accept that democratic vote, and we have to construct some kind of progressive uh, version of Brexit, a form of Brexit that favours working class people. Uh, and broadly speaking, I have sympathy for that, for sympathy for that position. Um, however, the position that Jeremy Corbyn uh, put immediately after the re referendum has come under intense pressure in recent months and has begun to change. And I think there are two um, forces driving this. The first is that Corbyn is deeply isolated within his own party. 
As I said before, his natural instincts are actually critical of the European Union, but if you look at the people he's won to the Labour Party, overwhelmingly they are pro-Remain. Not only that, but the people within Parliament, and even within, in, within his own cabinet, by and large are pro-Remain right-wing MPs who are hangovers from the previous Labour leaderships. Uh, who will do anything that they can to sabotage uh, what Corbyn is trying to do in the, in, 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 in the Labour Party. And are pulling, uh, putting enormous pressure on Corbyn to endorse a second referendum that could potentially reverse Brexit altogether. This will be a disaster. Why will it be a disaster? Because it says to those 17 million people who voted for Leave, largely out of a hatred of the establishment, we're going to make you vote again and again and again until you come to the conclusion the establishment wants. I think there's a poem by uh, Brecht, isn't there, about we should dissolve the people and elect another. This is the kind of attitude that these people have. Don't listen to the people. The second reason why this position from Corbyn keeps coming under pressure is that um, when Labour argues in terms of a, a, of a shared um, a, a progressive interest, they tend to talk in terms of a shared national interest. So inbuilt into this is a series of arguments that are deeply ambiguous about what kind of relationship Britain should have with Europe. And the question of what's good for working class people often gets replaced with what's good for, for, for capitalist firms. So there's all kinds of ambiguities in this position. This position has been pulled uh, more and more to the right. And part of that process is Labour essentially surrendering on the question of free movement, which I say I think is a profound mistake. The very last thing I will say is I just want to briefly outline what I think our position, the Socialist Workers' Party's position, the position I would take about this is, which I would characterise as a sort of internationalist left exit position. which I should say it's a minority position on, on the left and even the radical left, but I think it's the right position and it's a position we're, we're continuing to fight for. And our position is fairly simple. Uh, first of all, we always argued, all the way through the referendum we argued, and we've continued to argue for independence from the mainstream Leave campaign. The mainstream Leave campaign is run by racists and nationalists. We can't actually integrate ourselves into that campaign. Secondly, opposition to uh, any expressions of, uh, of racism towards migrants, towards refugees. I don't think freedom of movement in Europe is genuine freedom of movement because it excludes non-Europeans. Nonetheless, I'm going to fight tooth and nail to defend even the limited freedom of movement that exists inside Europe. Uh, and we will not accept any deal uh, with the European Union that sacrifices that freedom of movement. So if there was a second referendum that asked people to choose between Theresa May's deal and remaining in the European Union, our position would probably be a position of abstaining in that referendum. We would not vote to endorse a deal which involved giving up uh, freedom of movement. Fourthly, to go back to what Corbyn says about progressive working class alternatives to the European Union, which does mean breaking with the key institutions of the European Union. It doesn't mean remaining inside the single market in any form. It means a fundamental break, which would free any incoming government to introduce progressive pro-working class uh, demands. So that's our general argument about the European Union. But critically, we combine this with fighting for the maximum possible unity of the working class around the kind of demands that we're putting in the here and now. And there, 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 there's one very obvious area in which this is vital, and that's the fight against the, the, the right and the racist in British society. See, one of the problems since the referendum is the way that the arguments over Brexit have been identified purely with the radical right. And it means that when the radical right march on Parliament, as they did, as they did yesterday, sections of the left say what we have to do is we have to mobilise against them on the basis of a pro-EU position. This is terrible politics, because it, it, it effectively excludes from anti-racist organising 
anyone who voted Leave in the referendum. And we have been very determined to try and build a united anti-racist movement in Britain, Stand Up to Racism is the main organisation in this, that says we will take no position on this, and we will work with people on both sides of the Remain and Leave division. And in addition to this, we want to fight for a working class agenda of struggle. The, the problem with all these arguments around Brexit is they lead to passivity. People are waiting for Jeremy Corbyn to form his government, or they're waiting to see what happens as the outcome of the Brexit debates inside Parliament. What they're not doing is they're not mobilising in the streets. And one of the great tragedies in this moment is that there has been no attempt by Jeremy Corbyn, by the big trade unions, by the left more generally, to say you should all be out on the street demanding the fall of this government and a new general election in Britain. There may be a general election in Britain now, but this is largely through accident rather than from a dynamic driving left-wing working class insurgency. And we've argued throughout this, we have to be out there fighting for a new election and fighting for a progressive alternative. So in conclusion, we should remember this is a moment of extraordinary weakness for the British establishment. It's a moment of deep crisis. And crisis opens up opportunities, not just for the radical right, but for the radical left. It is vitally important that we overcome the divisions around Brexit and try to put forward an agenda in which the radical left can begin to unify and begin to seize these opportunities and begin to talk about what a progressive outcome of these debates would look like. Thank you.